be seated. We're continuing our study in a very, very important topic tonight as we are looking at deacons and elders and as we are learning what God has to say about those whom he would place in authority in his church. This is not merely a matter of politics. It's not merely a matter of who is most popular. It's not a matter of who has the most money. It's not a matter of uh, who gets uh, the most uh, points from the congregation in terms of their personalities. It's a question of who would God appoint in his church? This is his church. This is not our church. This is his church. And the body of believers around the world are his church. And he is the one who determines what the qualifications are for men whom he would place in different aspects of ministry in his church. We need to keep that in mind whenever we are thinking in terms of deacons. And as you know, we are praying fervently that God will raise up men who are qualified as deacons to serve here in this local church. It's a very definite and important need that this church has. We are comparing Acts chapter 6, that threefold overview that we saw there as to the qualifications, the outline of what a deacon is supposed to be like, and comparing it with the doctrinal explanation that the Apostle Paul gives to us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 7 through 16. The three tests that we saw in Acts chapter 6 are that they must be men of good report, they must be full of the Holy Ghost, and they must be full of of wisdom. And the explanation of that, as Paul breaks that down into its component parts, is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. And we see that parallel with that first qualification in 1 Timothy chapter 6, must be men of good report. So Paul starts there, he must have a good report of them which are without. That is, the outside world watches the church. Unbelievers are examining you and your life every day. And so as you do your business, as you involve in commerce, or as you involve in whatever profession you are in, you are being examined by unbelievers because they know if you are a witness, they know that you are a Christian. Do you have a good report of them which are without? Because if you don't, you will fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings on the going forth of your word tonight. We pray that you will encourage our hearts with it and cause us to understand those things which you have written therein. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we begin, Dan, uh, I just realized Megaly's not here to run the sound room and turn on the tape. If you don't mind, I will give you the key and uh, ask you to do that. Yes, do pray for Megaly. She has flown out to help Anastasia, who is nearing her due date. And uh, so she'll be available to take care of little Dietrich. And uh, when Stas and Daniel go rushing off to the hospital, probably in the middle of the night. So uh, pray for her while she's out there. She uh, is hoping to be there for about a month and uh, sort of help them through this uh, initial crisis that always takes place, as you know, those of you who've had children. 
Uh, so we're over here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, looking at deacons and elders. And we've looked thus far at several of the terms that are used here in this chapter to give us an understanding of what God expects of men who are placed into this office. We're dealing with serious business because as leadership goes, so goes the church. If leadership has moral defect, the church will have moral defect. If leadership has laziness and sloth, the church will have laziness and sloth. If leadership has a bad testimony before the world because they look at him as a man who does not pay his bills and who is uh, continually running up debts and having all kinds of financial problems, the church will likewise have those kinds of problems. What we need to understand is God sets the shepherds, both those in the office of elder and those in the office of deacon, as examples for the flock. They have specific areas of ministry, and we see that, but they also have a responsibility in terms of setting examples. As we've mentioned before, and as we have seen partly, deacons are the training ground for those who will become elders. The office of a deacon, as we saw, has many of the things that are very standard for the Christian life. And so what we're looking for is people not who are spiritual giants, but people who are spiritually normal from God's perspective. The things that are essential for each of us to have in our lives, whether men or women, these are things that should be the normal character qualities of those who would fill the office of a deacon. And the first thing that we had seen was that word, the deacons must be grave. Now that's semnos, that's the seriousness of purpose and respectability in conduct. It denotes one who is reverend, august, venerable. Those are heavy words. But that is what that word semnos means. It is also, as we'll see tonight, it's a requirement for the wives of deacons down in verse 11. Even so must their wives be grave. That's semnos there. It's a character quality that most must characterize both the husband and wife team in the office of a deacon. The term is also used of aged men in Titus chapter 2, verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, it's the word translated grave there, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. It's the word semnos that's translated honest in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are semnos. Those things that are serious of purpose. Those things that are respectable in conduct. This is the kind of stuff that is to characterize all believers. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are semnos, honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Semnos thus goes back not only to the actions of those who would fill the office of a deacon, but it goes back to the way in which they think. Think on these things. Deacons are to take seriously the responsibility with which they've been entrusted, and thus only serious-minded men should be placed in the office. And as we've said before, all mature believers should be serious-minded, according to that passage, in Philippians chapter 4. The second thing was that they could not be double-tongued, dialogos, saying different things to different people, hypocritical yes-men who agree with whatever happens to be coming out of someone else's mouth, whether it's right or wrong, just so you can gain favor. They've got to be men who speak the truth in love, even though it may be unpopular. Lying fits the category of double-tongued, and we've looked at the various verses that deal with that. The control of the tongue is tied to the office of a deacon by James in James chapter 1, 26 and 27. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The deacons are entrusted with that responsibility, as we saw in Acts chapter 6, of caring for the widows in the congregation. We're going to see also that that's one of the reasons that a deacon must be married. There is a very important safety feature built into that, and God requires it, as we'll see in a few moments. But we find the control of the tongue is connected with that ministration. 
We see in James chapter 3, and it's a long chapter, so we won't read it again. We read it last time we were together on this subject, which was three weeks ago. But we see in James chapter 3, there's a con connection between the controlled tongue and wisdom. And what was the qualification, the third given in Acts chapter 6? They must be full of wisdom. And so James ties the tongue and the control of the tongue to wisdom because that is one of the things that will most manifest what is inside of you is your tongue. Is it wisdom? Is it the wisdom of the world? Is it earthly, sensual, and devilish, world, flesh, and the devil? Or is it the wisdom that is from above which is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy? Wisdom and the tongue go together, and this is very clearly part of the office of a deacon. We saw that phrase, not given to much wine, plus a contas, to clutch to oneself, to hold firmly to. The same word used in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, where it's translated, neither give heed to, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Just like the false teachers were clutching to themselves false doctrine, which is what that passage is about, and causing others to doubt rather than to have faith and thus doing great damage to the church, even so there are those who insist that it is their right, they clutch to themselves their so-called right, to drink alcohol, and thus they harm the weaker brethren and put a stumbling block in their way. Paul says you should not have a man who is a deacon who makes that kind of a claim. Take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weaker brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you so sin against the brethren, you wound their weak conscience, and you sin against Christ. We talked about the different categories of the weaker brethren. We talked about what it means to put a stumbling block in the way. Paul includes both food and drink in that. He says, it's good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. We have a responsibility one for another. And God's kind of love does not insist on its rights. Instead, it curtails its own rights so that it might benefit those who are weak. Our Lord Jesus Christ did that when he came to earth. He had all the rights of God, for he is God. But he veiled those in flesh and humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We need to remember that is the position and attitude that those who are in leadership must take. It is the servant heart, humbling ourselves, for the sake of those who are weak. In other words, if a man uh, clutches to himself this so-called right to drink, he's disqualifying himself from the office of deacon. If he insists or holds firmly to his so-called Christian liberties of drinking alcoholic beverages. And as I said three weeks ago, you don't entrust defenseless Christian women and church money to men who insist that they have the right to drink alcohol. I think that's quite obvious. I mean, that's a no-brainer. They'll use the liquor to seduce the women. They'll use the liquor and embezzle church funds. They must be controlled instead by the Spirit of God. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. We saw that that word is the same word as take heed in Acts chapter 20, 28, and 2 Peter 1, 19. We are to take hold of, we are to clutch firmly to ourselves, that which is a protection for the flock. Take heed. That's our word, to clutch firmly. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Very, very interesting, that passage. We don't have time to go into it tonight, but that's a, one of the definite, uh, definite proofs of the deity of the Holy Spirit here in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. We find in 2 Peter 1.19, we have both also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed. That's our word, to clutch firmly to yourself, to hold on to, to grip tightly. 
Take heed unto the more sure word of prophecy, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Quite a difference between those who hold firmly to the scriptures and those who insist on their right to drink alcohol. It's also the next phrase, not greedy of filthy lucre. That quite clearly ties in with the issue of alcohol. You know, people who are under the control of alcohol and drugs will do anything to get money. They'll steal, some of them even kill for it. Because they've got to have the next drink. They've got to have that next shot in the arm. So he says, not greedy of filthy lucre. That's the same qualification, by the way, given back in verse 3 for those who are elders, because they're handling church money. It's at that point that Judas failed. It was at that point that Ananias and Sapphira failed. It was at that point that Barnabas proved his qualifications by his generous giving and not holding back. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Covetousness is idolatry. You've heard me say that probably 20 times. You're going to hear me say it if I live. And if the Lord tarries, you'll probably hear me say that hundreds of more times. Covetousness is idolatry. And the covetous man is an idolater. That's precisely what Paul says in Colossians 3, 5. And in first, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 5. Obviously, no deacon should ever be an idolater. And no one who is an idolater should be appointed to the office of a deacon. Holding the mystery of the faith and the pure conscience, that's the, the next phrase that we see here in our text. The deacon is entrusted with two things. Number one, church money. Number two, the mystery of the faith. The mystery of the faith is that New Testament body of truth set forth by new special revelation given to the New Testament apostles and prophets. And Paul explains that in Ephesians chapter 3, 1 through 5. We'll not go through that passage again. We've talked about it on several occasions. As stewards of the money and the mystery, deacons are held accountable for both equally. And don't just think of deacons in terms of money. You know, too many churches think of it that way. God speaks specifically concerning holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. The deacon has a responsibility for the... New Testament revelation for knowing the scriptures, understanding the scriptures, understanding the will of God as revealed in the scriptures, first in relation to his office and then in relation to his ministry to those to whom God has sent him. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1 and verse 2 follows it up. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You see how these things tie together. They are all essential elements of the way in which deacons are to function in the local church. Deacons also have to be men who are able to pass the truth to the next generation. They have to be skilled in that body of truth. Paul speaks of passing the truth to a new generation of believers, and certainly deacons are not exempted from that process. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. One of the qualifications we've seen of deacons. Faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You know, I've had contact with churches in the past, and in some cases have had in churches that I've served in the past, men who like to handle money, but they didn't want to ever teach anybody anything. They like to count the money, and they like to put it in the bank, and they like to write checks, but they did not want to either learn the scripture or communicate it to anybody else. They're not qualified to be deacons. Because the Word of God specifically makes it clear that deacons are to be stewards of the mysteries of God. They are to pass it on to the next generation. They are required to be found faithful in that stewardship. The second qualification in this phrase is in a pure conscience. They must be men who do not have a guilty conscience. They must be men who have had their conscience cleansed by the blood of Christ. And I quoted this verse this morning as we were looking at that almost closing passage in Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 
Deacons must be men who have dealt with both money and teaching the word in such a way as not to have any guilt in their consciences because they have abused that responsibility. That's a parallel. It's a dual responsibility that's set forth here in this particular phrase in 1 Timothy. Let these also first be proved, dokimazo. We talked about that in a good deal of uh, detail. A careful examination under fire gets used of testing gold. It's used of testing silver. It's used of testing other precious metals to determine their purity. It is a serious, in-depth examination. No man should ever be put into the office of a deacon who has not first been put through the test of fire. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you may present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may, and here's our word, dakimazo, that ye may prove you've gone through the test of fire. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's a serious examination. We're told in 1 Corinthians 3.13, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try. Dakimazo. The fire shall put to the test of fire every man's work, of what sort it is. Many passages that we could look at, we find that in the passage dealing with the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We read it every time that we hold the Lord's table here. Let a man examine himself. Dakimazo. Put himself through the test of fire to see that he's gotten his sins confessed before he comes to the Lord's table. After careful examination, he must be found blameless. Only then can he be placed in the office of a deacon. And by the word, as we, as we said before, the word blameless does not mean sinless. It means one who cannot be called into account. One who will not have anything laid to his charge after public investigation. It's a serious responsibility as we look into those whom God would place in that office. That, by the way, is the same word that's used of elders in Titus chapter 1, verse 6. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, doesn't mean sinless, but it means after a very careful scrutiny, after a public investigation, he has nothing that can be laid against him as a charge. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And we'll talk more about that when we get to elders. A deacon also has to be married, and his wife must possess certain character qualities, or else she will disqualify her husband. Look at it here in this passage. It says, even so must their wives be grave. Not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Even so must their wives be grave. Same word as we said a few moments ago that's used of the deacon back in verse 8. It's the word semnos, serious of purpose, respectable in conduct. The wives of the deacons must have the same parallel character qualification. Even so must their wives be grave. It's used of the aged women. It says the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. We saw it used of aged men in connection with deacons. We see it now being used of aged women. That they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. When you're looking for a man to fill the office of deacon, you take a very close examination of his wife. Wives need to recognize and practice the seriousness of their husband's responsibility. It is absolutely important to understand that the position of influence is often stronger than the position of authority. Those who counsel, those who advise, those who act as the sounding board for are often in a position to give direction to one in authority. Presidents don't just make decisions on their own. Prime ministers don't just make decisions on their own. Kings do not make decisions on their own. They are surrounded by counselors. Those who are in positions of church leadership need a wife who will be a sounding board 
who will be one who is also sober-minded, one who is able to give the kind of encouragement, to see things perhaps from a slightly different perspective that will give insight to her husband. The next qualification for the wife is she must not be a slanderer. The word slanderer, I think I mentioned this to you last week just in passing, but means a false accuser. It's from diabolos, where we get our English word devil and diabolical. Just like her husband, the wife must have a controlled tongue. She cannot be a slanderer. She cannot be a false accuser. She cannot be double-tongued. She can't be saying different things to different people. Just like her husband must have a controlled tongue, the wife also must have a controlled tongue. You know, a man may meet all the other qualifications himself, but if his wife is a gossip, if she's given to finding fault with other people, if she spreads innuendo and criticism in the church, she has automatically disqualified her husband. The word slanderers is used of the apostles. That word diabolos is used, excuse me, not the apostles, the apostates. There's a difference between the apostles and the apostates. Uh, is used of the apostates in the last times in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 3. It tells us that these men will come in the last days during perilous times and it says they will be without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers. That's diabolos. Slanderers, those who have a tongue like the devil. The same word is used as a prohibition in speaking to older women who have to set the example for younger women. It says in verse 3 of Titus chapter 2, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers. That's diabolos. Not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That word, diabolos, is used 34 times of Satan. Any man who has that kind of a wife must not be allowed to be a deacon. The next qualification is sober. Now, most of us think in terms of sober in relation to somebody who passes the breathalyzer test when the policeman stops him on the street. Well, that is part of this word. There are, there is another word, sober, uh, which deals with sober-mindedness, but the one that's used here is nephalios. It's used to describe the qualification of a deacon's wife that she must be sober, and it means to be free from the influence of any intoxicant, liquor, or drugs. It, by the way, is also the word that is translated vigilant in verse 2, where it's used of one of the qualifications of an elder. It says a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, the first word, vigilant, is our word translated sober here, nephalios. And the second word, sober, is the word that uh, means to be sober-minded. So, vigilant gives you an idea of the idea of watchfulness. And that, by the way, is also included. We find the word used that way in many other places in the New Testament. So there's a dual impact on this word. Number one, free from the use of alcohol, liquor, intoxicant, and drugs. But it also includes the reason for that. So that a person will be watchful and have full use of their senses. And that second usage is seen in passages such as 1 Thessalonians 5.6. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Nephalios. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Nephalios putting on the breastplate of faith and love for an helmet, the hope of salvation. We find Paul uses it over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. It's the word translated watch. 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, that's nephalios, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We find it in 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be sober and watch unto prayer. That's the idea of having full control of your faculties, not under the control of an outside influence, so that you can be watching for the Lord's return. You all know verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. If you're under the control of narcotics, under the control of alcohol, under the control of some external influence that is controlling your body and your mind, you are prey for the devil. 
You are also not going to be watching out for his wiles and for his treachery and trickery. So as this is applied to the wives of deacons, since their husband has a position of responsibility, the wife must be free from any outside controlling force of the flesh which might cause her to misuse or abuse that which is entrusted to her husband. And that's why Paul gives us this huge encompassing summary in the next phrase. Faithful in all things. Paul makes it clear that the wife must be capable of being trusted with anything and in any situation. You see, she's going to hear things as she ministers with her husband that must be kept confidential. That's why she must have a Holy Spirit-controlled tongue. She'll sometimes be entrusted to help with both spiritual and monetary responsibilities. Before a man is brought into this office, not only he, but his wife should be examined closely to see the qualifications are being met. There's also a very interesting play on words here. That word faithful, it's the same root word for faith and for one who is a believer. Obviously no man is qualified who has a wife who is not a solid Christian. Questions need to be asked in her examination such as, does she really identify with her husband and the church in this ministry? Is she an unknown factor? Does she complain about the church and try to pull her husband and family elsewhere to other churches? Does she want to skip her own church if a special is happening at some other church to the detriment of her own church? Faithful in all things. All things. It's a pretty sweeping statement concerning the requirements for the wife of a deacon. Then in verse 12, Paul says, Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. You know, people have taken that, as we have dumbed down the English language, to thinking, oh, well, it means that a deacon, if he is married, and really doesn't have to be married, uh, but if he is married, this is what ought to be. No. That phrase, let be, is a third-person plural present active imperative in Greek, esosan. You have the responsibility, if you are to be a deacon, of being married. The deacons must each be the husbands of one wife. God requires deacons to be married. And Paul emphasizes it by using the imperative in this phrase in 1 Timothy 3.12. Looking at that also eliminates divorced persons who are remarried because from God's viewpoint that person is married to more than one person and is an adulterer. That is a heavy, heavy thought. But Paul says that in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. We'll be talking about that more at a later date. A widower who is remarried is qualified because death breaks the marriage bond. And Paul also explains that in Romans chapter 7. It appears also that a widower who is not remarried may also qualify, since the evidence would indicate that the Apostle Paul was a widower, and because he had proved himself in advance, therefore was qualified. He claimed the right to serve the church in all church offices. There's a lot that we have to talk about that, but we will get into that in another discussion. It says, ruling their children in their own houses well, they must be exercising the spiritual gift of ruling. Romans chapter 12, verse 8. And the gift of ruling is not what we think of as ruling, not the idea of being a boss. The gift of ruling which when we go through the spiritual gifts again, we will try to cover that. But the gift of ruling deals with standing before. That's prohistemi, that is the word that is used there. And so as he stands before his own family, he is setting an example for his family, and he is setting an example for the church. The example they set for their children and households is the same example that they will set before the church. Now we're talking the normal Christian life here, people. I think all of us as parents, all of us as grandparents, want to set the right example for our children and our grandchildren to follow. If a man is not doing that with his own family, how can he do it for the church? It's interesting that the word children is also in the plural, implying that 
not only must you be married but have more than one child because you're dealing with a much more complex situation the more you get believe me the more complex it gets incredible how every child is different just like every church member is different you know I've never found two of our children that are exactly like they do have some character qualities that come from my wife some that come from me and some that seem to come from out of the blue wonder where did that come from but we have the responsibility of modeling Christ before them do they always respond properly no they did not do church members always respond properly yes of course no they do not the idea of being one who stands before another as an example as an encourager as a helper as a comforter is one of the requirements that we have for the man who would be a deacon and then Paul goes on in verse 13 those who use the office of a deacon well not just those who in theory know what should be done those who use the office of a deacon well in other words, those who have met the qualifications that he's just set forth, those who have wives who have met the qualifications just set forth that are in harmony with the office of a deacon. It says, purchase to themselves. The word purchase there is to gain something through cost. To gain something through cost. And Paul uses, we don't have this in English, but Paul uses what's called the middle voice which indicates something that will end up in a personal benefit or in a personal damage it's something that you do to yourself active voice I hit him passive voice I was hit middle voice I hit myself <laughs> that's the idea we have a middle voice being used here he purchases to himself he gains through a cost to himself as he serves the brethren in humility it costs him something but the rewards are incomparable because it tells you what he gains to himself through this cost. It says he gains to himself, he purchases to himself a good degree. Now you know that's a rare word. But it means a step on an ascending staircase. He gets to take a step up. He's moving up a staircase. Those that use the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves, they gain through a cost a step on an ascending staircase. And as we've mentioned before, a man who functions well in the office of a deacon places himself in position to be considered to move up the staircase to being an elder where he has far more spiritual responsibility and far less temporal responsibility. There are other passages that deal with that. We'll save them for next week. But a deacon who uses his often well, office well is also opening up opportunities to use other spiritual gifts of leadership. Gift of pastor teacher, gift of teacher, gift of evangelist. We see Stephen, one of the first seven deacons, proclaims the gospel of Christ and is stoned to death for it. He is such an articulate witness he is such an articulate evangelist they can't tolerate him and they stone him but did you know there were other deacons in that list too and one of them is Philip and he's known as Philip the evangelist he gained a step on the ascending staircase where God used him to evangelize up and down the entire coast of Israel we'll talk about that more when we talk about Philip a little later on in the book of Acts they gain to themselves a step on an ascending staircase. God puts them in position for greater responsibilities, for greater authority, for greater witness, for greater testimony. Purchase to themselves a good degree, a step on an ascending staircase. And then that next phrase, and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Great boldness is great freedom of speech the deacon is not merely to be somebody who sort of sits in the back waits for the offering to come in and greedily counts it he's to be a man who is bold in his faith 
who has great freedom of speech in his faith, who is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You do not want non-spiritual, carnal men to be deacons. Great boldness in the faith. The faith is that body of truth, once and for all committed to the saints, which we are to carry forward generation after generation, proclaim it to our children, proclaim it to our grandchildren, proclaim it to the world around us. That body of truth that deals with the person and work of Jesus Christ. That body of truth that deals with our responsibilities before a holy living God. Great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Unreserved utterance of the truth even if it costs them their lives. These are serious qualifications that we're looking at here. Paul says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly, but if I tarry long, that thou mightest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself. This is something that's not merely a matter to be believed. This is something that is to control our lifestyle and our actions. He says, I wanted to make sure you understood, because I may not get there for a while, what you're supposed to do in relation to the office of elders and the office of deacons. Because this is essential for the church of God. How thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. We are not dealing merely with the government. We are dealing with Christ's church. This is how we as believers are to handle ourselves in the house of the living God. And he explains what is necessary to be communicated by those in positions of authority. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. We've talked on other occasions about the 17 different mysteries that are listed in the New Testament. God was manifest in the flesh. There's the incarnation. You need to understand who Jesus Christ is. You need to understand what Jesus Christ did. Look at the next one. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. You need to understand who Jesus is, you need to understand what he did. You must be willing not to compromise the truth of the faith. That's deacons. We haven't even begun to start on elders yet. We've mentioned a few things. But people right now, this church needs some deacons. We need godly men who fit these qualifications. We need men who have wives that fit these qualifications. We need those who are articulate in their faith and who will boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, who will refute gainsayers and stop their mouths. We need those who are able and willing to lay down their lives for Christ. We need those who have a good report of them that are without. We need men who are full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. We need men who are filled with wisdom. Are you praying for that? Are you praying for that? You need to be. We need leaders like that. We need elders who meet the qualifications of elders too. We'll be continuing on that. We need men of God who will stand here and stand on the truth of Scripture and, if need be, be willing to die for it as Stephen was. And if God lets us live, be willing to proclaim it as Philip did. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It sometimes rubs us the wrong way. It sometimes makes us tremble. It sometimes makes us angry. It sometimes humbles us and brings us to repentance because we know we are not living even the normal Christian life. We're living in the flesh. We're using as our touchstone the people around us instead of using as our touchstone the Word of God. 
We pray, Father, that you will raise up men in this church who are qualified to be deacons. We pray, Father, that you will raise up men in this church who have wives that are godly women, who qualify their husbands as deacons' wives. We pray for men, Father, who will stand before their children, giving an example and a testimony that brings glory to Jesus Christ and sets the way for those children to follow, that they might also set the way for the people of the congregation to follow. Only you can provide men like this, Father. Only you can raise up men like this. Only you can bring to this church men like this. But you are the one who places your people in the various local churches in the body of Christ so that they will have a full complement of both those who are qualified as leaders and those who have the necessary gifts to minister in whatever way that particular group of believers needs. Father, we thank you once again for the privilege we've had of being here tonight to study your word, and we pray that you will use it in each of our hearts. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.